Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and a very Merry Christmas to you all. Uh, we'd like to welcome you all to our Winter Spring webinar series uh, today. This is our final one, and we've saved the best for last. Um, and today's webinar series is brought to you by myself. My name is Tim Michaelini, uh, Regional Manager for the Northern Region of LBC uh, Support Services. We're joined today by Dr. Claire Himmelwein. Uh, Claire is a consultant hematologist at Auckland City Hospital. Her main research interests are acute leukemias and lymphomas, with a particular interest in these diseases in teenagers and young adults. Uh, she moved to New Zealand in 2016, uh, having trained and worked in London prior to that as both a pediatric and adult hematologist. Her research was in mouse models of infant leukemia at the Institute of Child Health. And she will be speaking to us today on understanding research on cannabis and the practicalities of prescribing. Over to you, Claire. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Tim, and thank to, uh, thanks to the LPC for asking me to give this talk. I have changed this um, title slightly, as you'll notice, um, just to give some uh, you know, practical experience of my prescribing these drugs to certain patients. Um, the reason that we're all talking about cannabis and marijuana and cannabinoids is because there's um, been lots of information uh, from uh, celebrities in the news and on the big wide web of patients like um, Olivia Newton-John using marijuana um, to help her get through the treatment of stage four breast cancer. This is a picture of um, some New Zealand celebrities uh, and advocates for the use of cannabis. And this is taken at a meeting in Takapuna a couple of years ago where they started a discussion on its use. And also none of us can ignore the big referendum that has just gone on um, with the no vote uh, being 57% after all the votes were counted and the yes being 48.4% with a very uh, narrow margin of just 67,000 votes between the two. Um, I'm gonna talk about the background use of cannabis in medicine because it goes back a very long way. I'm gonna also talk to you about the terms that we use, some pharmacological aspects of cannabis and the pathophysiology of how it works. I'm then gonna talk about current legislation, uh, legislation and uh, how we prescribe it in New Zealand. Then I'm gonna move on to evidence for its use as an anti-cancer therapy, as an anti-emetic and as an analgesic and it, its use in palliative care. I'm gonna discuss cautions that should be taken into consideration um, when it's prescribed. I'm gonna talk about infectious considerations because they are particularly important in hematology patients. And that's obviously where I have my experience. And then I'm gonna conclude with some key points. So uh, there's reports of um, cannabis tea being used back in 2737 BC by a Chinese emperor. He gave it to peoples within, people within his court and it was used for all sorts of things, sleep disorders, infertility, um, rheumatism, gout. And even in one quote, it was for forgetfulness, it was used as well, or absent-mindedness. So um, more recently, uh, back in the late 1800s, um, it was actually fairly widely used within West, uh, Western medicine. And there was actually literature suggesting that it was very useful for intractable epilepsy and mus as a muscle relaxant. And we're using it for that in the modern day practice in pediatrics with um, childhood epilepsy and in mu uh, multiple sclerosis where it's very useful as a muscle relaxant. It was also used at that time for rheumatism and rabies and tetanus and all sorts of other um, uses that have gone out of fashion. Then uh, in the 1920s and 30s, cannabis was banned. And in the UK, it was classed as a class B not narcotic and in the UK as a schedule one narcotic. And this 
completely slowed down any research that medics could uh, do with uh, using cannabis for various uh, uses, but didn't completely prevent research. And a lot of research has actually been done in countries like Israel, Canada and Australia, rather than, you know, Europe and the US, where a lot of research comes out of. It wasn't actually until 1988 that um, cannabinoid receptors within the human body were discovered and the endocannabinoid system, because we produce cannab uh, cannabinoids ourselves, and we have receptors within our body, and they're important for maintaining homeostasis, which just means maintaining the environment of the internal body despite external um, stimuli. Um, there are huge polar views when, when you bring up the subject of cannabis. There are some groups where it is highly stigmatized and people that might benefit from some of its uh, activities will not even uh, you know, engage because of the stigmatization stigmatization. Whereas um, there are other groups that will claim it can treat almost any condition. So th this is the problem that we deal with. Um, there have been surveys done, uh, a lot of them in the States, but also in Europe, of adult cancer patients, just to get an idea of how many are actually using cannabis, either medicinally or smoking marijuana or inhaling. And um, in this survey in 2017, up to a, a quarter of patients had used some form of cannabis in the last year. So it's being used by patients. Um, people have also done surveys again in the US and Europe. This is a 2018 study which asked US oncologists about um, their familiarity with prescribing uh, cannabis and only 30% felt that they had sufficient information uh, to be able to give recommendations to patients but actually 80% um, would discuss it um, its use um, with patients and also two-thirds of them felt it was actually helpful as an adjunct for pain. Now I've worked in the UK and now I've worked in New Zealand and I know that if this survey was done amongst my colleagues um, that these percentages would be a lot lower um, to the point that it, it's often not discussed at all. And even in my practice, it will generally be, you know, a patient asking about it or if someone is really running into trouble with really severe sickness, despite all the standard treatments. Um, just to understand a bit about the plant cannabis, there are two main strains. So there's cannabis sativa and cannabis indica. Um, Originally, they were very separate and they contain different, each species contains different cannabinoids. But now um, people have uh, made hybrids of these two strains and uh, the breeds now they can, uh, you know, enrich them for various contents that they feel are important. When you have cannabis leaves, there are actually a hundred, at least a hundred different cannabinoids. And there are many other compounds, up to 300 other compounds. And no one really understands with all those chemicals that you're inhaling when you smoke uh, marijuana, we don't know which ones are important for which effects. And there are um, the two most well-studied ones, a THC, which stands for tetrahydrocannabidol, and CBD, which probably many of you will be familiar with, which stands for cannabidiol. Um, these have been much further studied, um, but there are other uh, compounds like terpenes, which may be really important in the effects that uh, when you smoke cannabis, they have. And these are not included in any of the medicinal cannabis that doctors can prescribe. It's become really obvious that it's not important which cannabis strain is used because uh, of all these hybrid formulations, but uh, you have to know the chemical profile of the uh, substance that you're prescribing and how much THC and how much CBD there is in it because the um, ratios are really important for side effects and efficacy. So generally when, when I talk about medical cannabis, I'm talking about any form of cannabis that's used to treat symptoms or disease, and that is legal or illegal. Cannabis um, just generally refers to the dried uh, leaves. Hash or hashish refers to the res resin that's extracted from the leaves. 
And then cannabinoids is a term that includes our own uh, naturally produced cannabinoids, which are in our body phytocannabinoids, which are cannabinoids that are extracted from um, the cannabis plant and are produced for medical purposes. And then we can also make synthetic cannabinoids. And um, many of those are actually uh, used in America and they're FDA approved. Um, the potency of cannabis um, is varying and um, it's definitely increased worldwide uh, since the 1980s and the potency is dictated by the strain of plant and how much of each type there is in it and also the cultivation technique so um, the temperature that you grow the plant at the quality of light that it's grown under and the time at which it's harvested really affects the potency and also the type of preparation, whether you're using uh, medicinal cannabis, um, leaves, buds, or resin, and how it is actually consumed. So um, there's all sorts of routes of administration you can use on, but I'm just gonna focus on inhalation and oral consumption as capsules. So if you inhale cannabis and um, this has a really fast onset of action. So it would be really useful for a very acute pain or acute nausea. Um, the THC within the uh, product peaks, the levels peak by three to 10 minutes and it is all cleared by three hours. However, if um, THC is made into capsules, there's a, a, a delayed onset of action and usually after you've taken the capsule, it takes about 90 minutes to take effect and it peaks up to five hours after you've taken the drug. And that effect is long acting and can be effective for up to 20 hours. Um, as you'll see, I've put 20, uh, 12 to 20 hours there because unfortunately there is erratic absorption from the gut and companies have looked at you know improving that because it would be much more useful if you had a much more predictable onset of action and um, length of efficacy and the oral consumption is much more useful for chronic conditions so chronic pain um, I've talked about this THC and CBD because uh, these are the only products that are actually available for me to prescribe. So THC is um, the component that is causes the psychoactive uh, effects, whereas CBD has no um, psychoactive effects. THC has many um, activities. It has anti-inflammatory properties. It has anti-nauseous properties and analgesic properties. And in some studies, it's been shown uh, in both oncology and HIV patients to be an appetite stimulant. Um, CBD actually works with THC and can moderate the effect of THC. And it actually, when they're given in combination, CBD blocks the breakdown of THC, which can produce a really potent metabolite, and it blocks that. So you don't get that really high peak levels of THC. And it also mitigates the sort of downsides of cannabis, like the potential for significant anxiety, panic attacks and paranoia. So it actually the combination given together improves the efficacy of the old uh, the whole drug and alone. CBD has analgesic, anti-inflammatory and anti-nauseous um, properties. Um, the other two cannabinoids that we make uh, within our body um, are detailed there and um, they're just more for interest uh, for you to be aware of them. So the endocannabinoid system and CB1 and 2 receptors are found throughout the body and they are really important for physical and cognitive in functions. Um, the CB1 receptor is highly concentrated in the brain and the spinal cord, whereas the CB2 receptor is located in the organs throughout the body and is important in immune function more than pain. And the CB2 receptor is at a much lower level than CB1. But it's important to note that, you know, we have 
the CB receptors, we also have opiate receptors. And there are many more cannabinoid receptors throughout the body than there are actually opiate receptors. But there is an interaction between the two. Now, THC acts on both receptors, both CB1 and CB2, but much more so on CB1, so it has different effects. And CBD actually has a low affinity for these receptors and, you know, as I've said, can moderate THC side effects and can actually antagonize or block those receptors. Um, everyone is concerned about the side effects. And as you'll see in the research that I'm going to present you, uh, side effects are an issue when you're prescribing these drugs. However, CBD products are generally extremely well tolerated at standard dosing. For some indications, you do need higher dosing, uh, like for epilepsy. But at standard dosing, um, you can get a bit of a dry mouth, like you can with various anti uh, sickness drugs, there can be a bit of drowsiness and fatigue and sometimes a bit of lightheadedness. However, with THC, you get those effects potentially, but also this risk of anxiety, euphoria and paranoia. And there are cardiovascular effects. It can lead to a tachycardia or a speeding up of the heart and orthostatic hypertension, which just means a drop of the blood pressure when you stand up quickly. We also know that THC leads to a slowing of your reaction time. So you shouldn't be using these products when you're using machinery or driving. And we know that with long term use, THC can cause cognitive impairment and depression. And so it's really important that you start off at a very low dose and that THC is combined with a CBD product so that you get the best effect. There are contraindications and these are clearly not for everyone. As I've mentioned, um, there are cardiac or pulmonary uh, complications with the um, speeding up of the heart rate and the dropping of the blood pressure. So we wouldn't prescribe them to people with severe cardiac or lung disease, pulmonary disease. Um, they are excreted mainly through the liver. So if someone has got liver impairment or kidney impairment, you get a much more exaggerated and prolonged effect and it's not safe to prescribe them in those people. Um, they shouldn't be co-prescribed with sedatives or other psychoactive drugs uh, because, again, the risk of an exaggerated, unpredictable response. And... Um, you know, they shouldn't be prescribed to people who have a personal or family history of psychotic disorders. And I'm talking more about THC here. Potentially CBD rich formulations can still be used for these people, but with caution. As I've mentioned, they are broken down or metabolized uh, within the liver. So um, if patients are on lots of other drugs, um, the doctor that's prescribing it needs to take this into consideration because they can increase or decrease uh, the levels of certain drugs, which can be, you know, very important. And um, it's really important that, you know, the patient is considered as a whole. Um, but generally, uh, CBD and THC uh, can be prescribed safely and don't have major interactions with other drugs. So in New Zealand, um, it remains illegal to, for the medical use of cannabis, i.e. the leaves, buds. There is one product that is approved in New Zealand, and that is uh, an oral spray called Satavix. And that has equal concentrations of THC and CBD. And MedSafe, the agency that approves drug in New Zealand, has approved this for the as a muscle relaxant or to prevent spasticity in multiple sclerosis. But again, as you'll see in a lot of the um, evidence that I present, it is always as an adjunct or in addition to the standard treatments. It is not a use only. You wouldn't just give someone a CBD, THC product. Um, recently, at the beginning of April, it actually um, became possible for specialists to prescribe this Satavix spray uh, for other uses other than um, 
uh, multiple sclerosis, but it has to be within their scope of practice, i.e., you know, I can prescribe it for nausea and vomiting uh, induced by chemotherapy, but I wouldn't be prescribing it for epilepsy because I have um, no experience in that. Then there are lots of unapproved products that are available in New Zealand. So uh, there are many companies that produce just CBD products and a CBD product um, has to have less than 2% THC because of the psychoactive effects. And that is not classified as a control drug um, like morphine under the, U the Misuse of Drugs Act. And so doctors can prescribe that on an ordinary prescription if they feel happy, and they can actually give someone a three month supply. The other products uh, like um, those that contain THC, so either their THC alone or their CBD with THC, anything containing THC, THC is a control drug uh, on that misuse of act, uh, misuse of drugs act 1975. And this means that currently, if I want to prescribe someone a THC containing product, then I need to fill out an application to the Ministry of Health, where I detail the patient's name, I detail what um, drug or, uh, you know, the percentage of the CBD and THC within the drug that I want to prescribe. I have to detail what I am using it for, whether it's for um, uh, as an anti-sickness agent, as pain or as palliative care. I also have to provide evidence. So I, I send papers to them, evidencing that the drug has action in this group of patients. I also have to provide a dosing schedule of how I'm going to dose the drug and what dose I'm going to start at and how I'm going to build up. And also a tapering dose program so that if the patient doesn't tolerate it, um, I can safely withdraw it. I have to get the patient to sign a consent form to say that they know that this is an unlicensed drug and that if at any point they're found to be using it inappropriately, the um, Ministry of Health approval that is usually given to me can be withdrawn at any time. I have to prescribe it on a special prescription that we prescribe um, control drugs on like morphine, where I have to write in words and numbers exactly how much of the product I want the patient to be given. And I can only prescribe a one month supply. Um, wholesalers that want to import this product that contains THC have to have a license. Any pharmacy um, can supply it, but they cannot order it in until they have a prescription from a doctor. They cannot have it sitting there on the shelf and they can only order in the quantity that the doctor has prescribed. And um, as I'm sure you're realizing, this drug is not pharmac approved like you know many of the other drugs that we prescribed. So the funding has to come from the patient. And just to give you an idea of how much these drugs cost, um, this is the Tilray product. So um, Tilray make a CBD only product in a 25 mil or a 40 mil um, bottle with a, uh, you know, it's got a little, that top comes off and you can measure the amount that you want to give. Um, and they, these are two different concentrations. There are lots of other companies that produce similar products in New Zealand, um, but Tilray is the only one um, that produces, uh, uh, they don't, they produce it, it's all imported in again. There are no CBD products or CBD and THC products currently being made in New Zealand. But having spoken to a number of um, companies uh, in New Zealand that are endeavoring to do this, potentially in the next year or so, there will be New Zealand owned products. Otherwise, everything is imported either from Canada or the States. So Tilray are the only company that make um, a THC and CBD product. And in this particular one, it's in a one to one ratio. And in Australia, they do do other ratios. So five to 20, which can be useful. 
And so hopefully they will be coming to New Zealand because they will suit different um, groups of patients. This is a THC only, and I would never prescribe this on its own, um, but you can prescribe it with the CBD 25 so that you can get different ratios. And as you'll see, the CBD products are extremely expensive because it's really difficult to extract CBD from the leaves, whereas THC is much easier to extract and the products are therefore cheaper. These are the wholesale prices and these are up to date, but they don't include GST. And also what has become quite obvious to me when I've been doing some research the pharmacists that um, stock this, um, they all add a varying markup. So some pharmacies will add a few dollars. Some, uh, I've heard, uh, can add up to $150. So it is really important to shop around. And often the companies will, you know, can help you with various pharmacists that um, don't put that massive markup on. And I know that there's um, a pharmacy in Henderson and there's another one in Morrinsville that are heavily recommended as the pharmacists there keep the markup to an absolute minimum. The other thing that you're probably thinking is, you know, you must give different treatments and different doses to someone who has never um, been exposed to cannabis, you know, by whatever form, or to someone that has um, used a lot of cannabis over their life. So what I would normally do in those people that are naive, I would start with just a CBD formulation. And I start at a twice a day dose. If I'm really concerned, I might just start at a once a day dose at night. And then each week, I titrate up the dose according to side effects and um, you know, efficacy, how well it's working for whatever I've prescribed it for. And we tend to use the CBD only formulations for those that have contraindications to THC or those that are sent that could be sensitive to the psychoactive effects of the THC part. If the CBD rich formulation doesn't work, then I will go up to a CBD and THC uh, containing product. And these have very low doses of THC. So um, often just 2.5 milligrams of THC with 2.5 milligrams of CBD. And if you read any literature, you start low, go up slow and stay low. Um, in a lot of the studies, using higher doses of THC cause a lot of toxicity. And again, what I'd normally do is start off on the product twice a day at a dose of two milligrams of both CBD and THC, and then every week go up, um, up to a dose of 10 milligrams. And again, monitoring the patients for their response and any side effects they're having. So probably most importantly, you know, why would I prescribe um, any of these uh, cannabinoid products. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the evidence for anti-cancer effects. And unfortunately, and um, I'm sure this won't be in the future, right now the bottom line is there is no high level evidence to suggest that uh, cannabinoids can control or cure cancer. However, there are many articles of interest and there are many ongoing trials, particularly if you go to the um, clinical trials uh, database, which covers trials all over the world. The, the two diseases that really, um, you know, you pick out is glioblastoma, which is a brain tumor and pancreatic cancer. Um, and you know, these really stand out and trials are ongoing in those. But there are trials in myeloma, uh, in leukemia. Now, the reason that there is no evidence that there is laboratory evidence of an effect. And, um, uh, you know, if you use mice models or cell lines of cancer, you can see tumors regress and we, we can see that they're prevented from metastasizing. And um, those effects can be visually seen, but that is a long way. Seeing an effect in a Petri dish or in a mice is a long way from it being used safely and efficaciously in humans. You have to go through many lines, phase one trials, phase two trials, phase three trials to ensure that there are no negative effects and that um, 
uh, you know, that there isn't the opposite effect and because potentially these drugs could cause, you know, cancer growth. There are numerous anecdotal case studies of anti-cancer effect uh, using marijuana, particularly in leukemia. And but right now there are no organizations or there are no review articles that will support the use of cannabinoids as a neoplastic agent. So how potentially do, does, do these cannabinoids work on cancer cells? So we know that they do induce um, death pathways. So the death pathways lead to death of cancer cells. And this is by the caspase pathway. They also can be seen to inhibit the proliferation of cancer cells, which is clearly important to prevent progression and spread. Um, tumors require um, vessels to grow within them to uh, deliver nutrients and to deliver oxygen. And a pathway called the VEGF pathway uh, controls this. And we know that cannabinoids downregulate that pathway. So prevent the growth of these blood vessels that are needed for the tumor to grow. To grow. There's also another pathway called the MMP2 that is really important in migration and adhesion and then invasion of organs by cancer cells. And we know that cannabinoids modulate this pathway as well. So there's preclinical evidence of effects, but you know, we need to understand more. Just a couple of articles, because I think most of the people that are listening will have an interest in hematological malignancies like myself. This is one from um, blood in 2016. Uh, we know that lymphoid cells that um, are what lymphoma is produced from have a high expression of CB2. Um, and we know that lymphoma cells also have a high expression of both CB1 and CB2. And particularly in mantle cell lymphoma and diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, CB1 is very strongly expressed. And people have done experiments on cell lines. So these are uh, cell lines that are growing that um, have these particular lymphoma phenotypes, we can knock down their or antagonize their CB1 receptors. And this leads to inhibition of the growth of the lymphoma cells. Um, and CB1 antagonists, which um, there's an example of one there, have been used on these uh, cell lines and lead to um, cell death uh, and arrest of uh, multiplication. And these, um, these CB1 antagonists actually use pathways that we use with chemotherapy. So, you know, we use PI3 kinase inhibitors and ATK pathway inhibitors to treat lymphoma. So there's the potential that these agents could synergize with chemotherapy, um, but we don't know. And, you know, we are a long way and um, many years away from proving Proving this and ensuring that they can be combined safely. This is just one in myeloma. We know that plasma cells um, express CB2 and um, people have done uh, again in plasma cell in plasma cell myeloma cell lines and in murine models of plasma cell myeloma studies of cannabinoids uh, have been done and we can see cell death and regression of myeloma um, tumors or plasma cytomas. But again, very early laboratory research. So now I'm going to be uh, moving on to chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, which, you know, I, I have um, more experience with and I've certainly prescribed these drugs for this indication. So we know that both THC and CBD have anti-nauseous effect. And as I hope I've got across, combining the two actually increases the effect. Unfortunately, there has been quite a lot of research done over the years, but unfortunately, a lot of it has been done comparing CBD and THC products to antiemetics that are out of date and not even used. Um, and so it's obviously really important CBD and THC is compared to modern antiemetic regimens. And we have numerous antiemetics. Now, they uh, CBD and THC, mainly THC, work by um, 
stimulating CB1 receptors. And this impairs serotonin and dopamine release, which leads to nausea. And other anti-sickness agents act as um, antagonists of serotonin or dopamine antagonists, like ondansetron, which many of you may have been on, or granisetron. That's a serotonin inhibitor, and metoclopramide is a, um, a dopamine agonist. So, as I say, there's lots of his, you know, there's lots of sort of archaic data, um, which isn't really relevant because we've had you know many new drugs and we have a prepotent now and you know olanzapine. These need to be compared to modern regimens. So this is a trial that was only actually published a month or two ago in the Annals of Oncology, and this looks a combination product of THC and CBD. So there's two. It's a capsule. There's 2.5 milligrams of THC in the capsule and 2.5 milligrams of CBD. And it's a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled phase two crossover trial. So, you know, a, a very relevant trial to my practice. Within this trial, and this was carried out in Australia, all centers were in Australia. Um, the patients had to be on intravenous chemotherapy that had a very high or moderate high risk of leading to vomiting. They had to have at least another two cycles left to receive. And they have to, had to have demonstrated that they had refractory nausea and vomiting, um, i.e. the doctors had given them steroids or dexamethasone. They'd given them the serotonin agonist like granisetron or ondansetron. They'd given them an NK1 antagonist like uh, a prepotent, and they'd given them, um, a, and some of the patients had also had a lanzapine. And despite this, they still had breakthrough nausea. Obviously, within the trial, the patients had to confirm that they were abstaining from other cannabis products and they had to produce regular urines to make sure of that. Um, it was quite a short trial. So um, they started the medication on day minus one. So that's the day before they received chemotherapy. And they just received one capsule on that day. And then on day naught to five, they were able to escalate the um, number of capsules they took according to their levels of nausea. And um, the maximum number of capsules they could take was four, which would be equivalent to 10 milligrams of CBD and 10 milligrams of THC. Unfortunately, as with a lot of these trials, um, there were only small numbers of hematological patients and they didn't even say what underlying hematological cancer they had. Um, I think from memory, there were just three of the nearly 100 patients that went into this. This uh, is the trial schema. So they were randomized. They had their first cycle of chemotherapy and they either received the cannabis or not. Then with their second cycle, this, why, this is why they had to have two cycles left, they received the alternative. So if they'd had cannabis, they then had placebo. And then if they were going on to receive a third cycle of chemotherapy, the patient and the doctor were blinded, but the patient was able to choose which, um, they were able to say which cycle they had the best nausea control, and they then went on to receive that. So um, they could receive either. And these were the results. So compared to placebo, the complete response means that they had uh, no vomiting and they required no breakthrough anti-sickness tablets on top of their recommended baseline. And it was doubled so that the patients that received CBD, THC, uh, there were 25% that had a complete response with no nausea, vomiting, and no breakthrough uh, drug requirement. And it was 14% in the placebo arm. Uh, which was statistically significant. And you can break down those effects into the absence of um, vomiting, the absence of nausea and the um, use of rescue medications and the effects were similar. There were side effects though. Nearly a third of patients had moderate to severe cannabinoid related adverse events and most of these were drowsiness. But interestingly, 83%, so those people that went on to receive a third cycle of chemotherapy, when it was unblinded, 83% of them had chosen the, the CBD and THC, and only 17% had chosen the placebo. 
So although there were adverse events, there were no serious adverse events, but I have to reiterate, a third of patients did have, um, you know, drowsiness in particular. And what is really important, this is a phase two trial, which is in a relatively small number of patients, but they are right now in Australia doing a phase three trial with 250 patients with a one-to-one -one randomization. And it's actually Tilray are the company that produced this capsule. So they do make a capsule as well as those bottles that I showed you. And if the results of the phase three trial are positive like this trial, they obviously will apply to Pharmac um, to look for funding. So overall, when I'm talking about nausea and vomiting, the use of cannabinoids for this, um, it is really important to look at long-term efficacy. This trial that I've just talked to you was two or three cycles. And so this current trial that I just mentioned, the phase three trial will be over many cycles of chemotherapy, you know, up to six to eight or even more. And so that will clearly provide more evidence um, uh, and potentially if the results are positive, uh, this data could be submitted to Pharmac. There will, of course, be non-responders, and um, it will be really important within that trial to look to see if higher doses can be used. But when higher doses are used, you often get more of the toxic effects. But maybe giving a different ratio of THC to CBD in this trial, it was one to one. And the big question that, you know, was running through my head, and I'm sure it's running through yours, that 83% that chose to have the T CBD THC product with their third cycle, was this due to the euphoria associated with the use of the drug or the sedative effects that made them feel less anxious and more chill? And it'll be really difficult to tease that out. But potentially you could with more in-depth questionnaires that the patients would fill out. Um, but the ongoing problem is there is still significant stigma um, associated with these trials and the use of cannabis. And even it took two and a half years to recruit that uh, nearly 100 patients in Australia. And so this is another serious problem that, uh, you know, is ongoing. But maybe with referendums and more talk uh, on the internet um, about the use, some of this stigma will go. This is the Australian guideline for the use of medical cannabis for nausea and vomiting. As you can see, it's, um, it was produced in December 2017, and that data that I've just presented you is from 2020. But just to, to show, and, and this, this reflects most of the guidelines around the world, um, it is recommended that uh, a THC medicinal cannabis product can sometimes be effective for nausea and vomiting, but should only be used when the newer standard approved products have failed. So it's an adjunct or where um, those other products are contraindicated. So I just want to give you a case study of a patient of mine um, who I prescribed both CBD and CBD and THC for. Um, he was a 36 year old male who a couple of years ago was diagnosed with stage 4B Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it was recommended that he have six cycles of ABVD treatment. So that contains um, four different agents that have a high emetogenic potential. And we would, as a standard, be giving them metoclopramide, uh, ondansetron, and um, aprepotent, so modern and triple therapy. So th this man had a baseline weight of 85 kg but due to the disease had actually lost five kg by the, five, by the time I met him and he was down to 80 kg. He had his first cycle of ABVD and I saw him pre-cycle two and he'd lost another five kg due to severe nausea, despite the three patients that I've just mentioned. Pre-cycle three, he'd lost another two kg and he was seen by one of the registrars and cyclozine was added. I then saw him again pre-cycle four and he's down to 71 kg. So that's over 15% total body weight loss. And I, at this point, added in dexamethasone, which in the UK was our standard with this regimen, but isn't used in New Zealand. 
I also, out of a bit of desperation, added in scopoderm, which is good if there's a, a motion uh, part to the nausea. And he did seem to have that. And um, it's a patch that you put behind your ear every three days and can work, again, if there's a motion part to the sickness. I also, because he lost so much weight, um, added in nozinan, which can be quite sedating. And I usually just give it as, at night as um, a very small dose, but can work very well uh, because he was finding it different, difficult to function. And with every cycle, the nausea and vomiting was getting worse despite me adding in more drugs. And he was really unable to work. So when I saw him pre-fourth cycle, um, I prescribed uh, the lower concentration CBD uh, because this man had never had uh, any uh, marijuana or cannabis before. And I started off at a low dose and titrated up and then went to the higher concentration. I then saw him because uh, it took us a little while to get the drug um, uh, and to find out which pharmacy uh, would bring it in because this was quite early. And actually, I have to say um, it was the patient and the patient's friend that approached me about this. And they had actually contacted Tilray in Australia and linked um, people from Tilray with me via email um, that gave me a lot of the information that I have used since then. So pre-cycle three, the weight loss is ongoing, but he's only lost, sorry, pre-cycle five. He's only lost one kg. Um, and this is with just the use of CBD. And um, they are keen to try a THC containing product to see if we can really get on top of this nausea, which is ongoing. So I filled out the application for the Ministry of Health. And usually within a few days, you get approval. And um, he went out and uh, uh, got the THC CBD product and started on it. Um, initially, I gave him a very low dose three times a day and then escalated up. I saw him pre his final cycle and his weight was stable for the first time ever. And there'd been a significant improvement in his nausea. And I then saw him after his final cycle when his weight was again stable and the nausea had settled and he had a much improved appetite. So, you know, just useful maybe um, to hear a personal story. The third thing that I'm going to talk about is the evidence for cancer pain. Um, cannabinoids work by uh, the agonist activity on CB1 and CB2. So that means they um, stimulate CB1 and CB2 receptors and reduce nociception, which is the awareness of pain, because the CB1 receptors, as you'll uh, remember, are in the brain. And it also works um, as an anti-inflammatory via a number of pathways. There have been a number of trials. So, so these are all the trials on pain. This is from a, um, a review uh, of all the trials done up to 2017. And you'll see this area is when they were used for cancer. So there were five trials. Three of them are really too small to um, get any useful information from. But there were two big randomized trials, um, which added up to nearly 600 patients. And I'm going to show you the results of those two trials. Uh, but generally, they've included in this that the information from these trials was insufficient. Again, as I've explained, um, real difficulty recruiting to these trials because of the stigma. and. Um, you know, the management of side effects and the attrition of patients that fall out of these trials. Um, so the first one I'm going to do, oh, sorry, this is a, this was a selective review. And if you look at those five cases, one of them had a negative result, but four of them actually showed that there was some potential uh, evidence of reduction in ca cancer pain. And all they concluded was that there could be some therapeutic potential, but this was not high level of evidence. So these are the two big control um, trials. So this is multi-center, double blind. So no one knows whether they're receiving um, their product or a placebo, randomized um, a study in intractable cancer pain. And this one was done in the UK and I think Belgium and France. 
It was funded by GW Pharma, uh, which are the company that make the Satavix, which is the spray that is um, approved in New Zealand for the spasticity of multiple sclerosis. Um, the patients were given either a THC and CBD product, just a THC product, or a placebo in a randomized double blind fashion. They all had to have severe or uh, moderate to severe pain at entry. And um, the investigators uh, got the patients to diarize all of their symptoms. As you probably remember, I said that this is an oromucosal spray, so it has a slightly quicker onset of action than uh, capsules. The patients had it for um, seven to nine days and they titrated up their dose themselves, although there was a maximum dose level. And then for the second week, they continued on that dose and the patients filled out their pain scores uh, throughout the study and they documented where they required any baseline uh, breakthrough analgesia. They all are on morphine and they all stay on their morphine at the same dose and the, um, the THC, the THC and CBD or the placebo are added on top. So all of these patients were on uh, up to 200, or the median dose was 270 milligrams a day of oral morphine. So considerable pa uh, pain levels. These are the main cancers, but there were um, a third of patients that were put in the other cancer. And I don't know, it's not documented within the, uh, the study how much of these uh, were, whether, whether there are any hematological uh, patients. The pain was described because obviously pain can be bony, it can be nerve pain, it can be visceral, which is organ pain, or it can be a mixture of all of these. So there was... Um, representation of all of these. And this study uh, was significant. The group that got the THC and CBD had half a halving of their pain scores compared to the THC alone and the placebo. So there was a 43% reduction in the pain scores in those that got the mixed product. Um, but there was no difference in the uh, use of breakthrough medication, so top up extra short acting morphine. And this is often um, that people, you know, want to use morph uh, this with morphine to reduce as a morphine sparing agent. So somewhat disappointing that there was no difference in the breakthrough medications. As an aside, there were memory and concentration issues and the scores deteriorated on the patients that got the THC and the THC CBD. And again, up to two thirds of patients nearly had adverse events, but the severe ones um, were all due to disease progression because all of these people had advanced cancer. Um, this is the second big study. Um, so that last one, I think, was about 200 patients. This was uh, over 300. And um, this used different doses of a, a THC and CBD product and a placebo. And again, all patients had to have severe, uh, moderate to severe pain. And I, I think we have to remember that people with advanced cancer have all sorts of uh, pains, psychosocial problems, and this is a very difficult group to manage their pain. Um, but all of these were not adequately controlled on morphine alone. In this um, study, there was a, they were on the um, CBD and THC for longer, which reassures me because that was a very short, short study duration in the last um, study I presented. So again, they had a one week dose titration up and then four weeks of stable dosing. And they were looking for a more than 30% improvement in the pain scores um, from baseline to the end of treatment. And they also, these patients were phoned every day. Well, I think it was every day or fairly frequently during the um, uh, study period and they over the phone they had to say their um, pain level and those were collected over the whole study. This was in fact a, a negative result. There was no statistical difference between the active drug and the placebo and these were the baseline changes which weren't significant. They did however do some sub-analyses and the, the low and intermediate dose THC and CBD um, there were some 
evidence of progression, uh, evidence of um, response, but it wasn't statistically significant. The adverse events were dose related. So those that got the higher dose, so remember there were three levels of dosing in this study. And the, the, the group that got the largest um, doses had the most AEs, so they were dose related. Um, there were significant AEs within both the uh, actively treated group and the placebo group. And there was one concern from this study, the death rate was actually higher in the, the people that got the CBD THC. But none of these deaths were considered be, to be related to the study. These people all had advanced and potentially terminal cancer. Um, so the conclusions from this study were again, you know, higher doses are not more effective. You just get more adverse events of this particular combination. Um, there is some benefit in the, the, the low and medium dose group, and it may offer some pain benefit in terminally ill patients with refractory pain. So I just wanna, you know, th these patients are extremely difficult to manage. And so, you know, anything that can uh, be used in conjunction with morphine or to spare the amount of morphine is, you know, highly desired. Um, as I've said, it's unclear whether there were many hematology patients in either of these studies. Um, there is a suggestion of benefit, but in, in, in that last study, um, this didn't achieve significance, but in the previous study, it did. Uh, really importantly, there are significant adverse events. So we need to understand better the pharmacology of these drugs and um, a definite need for larger, well-designed uh, studies in the future. And this is taken from a Canadian guideline, but again, reflects many of the guidelines around the um, world. If you're thinking of using a cannabinoid to treat um, pain in a cancer patient, you must discuss the risks and benefits because of the adverse events. It is reasonable to have a therapeutic trial when two prescribed analgesics have not been able to get on top of the pain and it persists. And again, as in with anti-sickness, for pain, cannabinoids should always be used as an adjunct. They are not a primary um, prescription to be used on their own. Just some cautions. Um, this is from a, um, a paper in 2017 where a, a laboratory bought various CBD products and um, analyzed them. And despite what was said on the box, 43% um, of them had more CBD than was quoted, 26% had less, and only 31% were actually accurately labeled. And the cannabis agency in New Zealand um, is trying to make sure that this doesn't happen here. So whenever I want to prescribe a THC or CBD product, I have to provide an analysis of the, the contents um, and they have to come from a well-recognized uh, laboratory. And uh, the problem often is in these CA CBD products, there's THC contamination. And as I said before, you have to have less than 2% THC for a product to be considered as a CBD product and for it not to be a controlled drug. Um, there are some potential harms that need to be considered. There is low evidence of uh, evidence that uh, cannabis causes psychotic symptoms if it's prescribed appropriately and low strength of ed evidence for exacerbation or the development of new mania. Um, it, there's moderate strength that it can affect cognitive disf dysfunction, particularly with long-term users. And this will be more smoking marijuana. And there's a possible link to increase suicide, uh, su suicidal ideation. Um, it can cause acute intoxication and collision risk. So very important that um, patients do not drive uh, on this product. Um, we're giving it often to prevent sickness, but there is this rare side effect where it can actually make sickness worse. I, I've never seen that. Um, there's mixed evidence on inducing violent behaviors. And um, 
the risk of addiction is there, but these patients that I would be prescribing for is for short term for anti-sickness and in people where it's being used for pain, it's generally for terminal pain. Um, all haematology patients worry about infections, as do their doctors. And um, this is just um, an idea of some of the infection outbreaks that have been associated with the use of marijuana and smoking marijuana or using it within um, a bong or uh, something like that. This is a TB outbreak in 2003 and another one uh, in Seattle, Washington, uh, where 11 patients uh, contracted TB from contaminated water. Um, this is uh, an example of a fungal infection in the lungs in a patient with colorectal cancer that was smoking marijuana. And um, this is in a renal transplant patient who would be heavily immunocompromised. Again, they got a fungal infection in their lung, which have a high risk of uh, mortality. And again, this was from smoking marijuana. Um, patients, there is, um, people have looked at infective complications in patients that are having a, um, a stem cell transplant. And, you know, we recommend that pe people should not be smoking marijuana or taking any other inhaled form, but that is very different from the capsules and the um, either synthetic cannabinoids or the extracted cannabinoids that I've been talking about in this talk. So just to conclude, um, key points. Um, if, if you look at trials that are ongoing, um, there are more and they are of better quality with large number of patients in, um, but we still right now lack large placebo controlled trials. But that phase three trial that's going on in Australia will be really important um, in the future use of cannabinoids to um, treat nausea. Unfortunately, if you look on the CB uh, in the um, clinical trial website, a lot of these trials say abandoned uh, because of slow recruitment, and this is due to the stigma associated with cannabis. And we still have a great deal of trouble um, getting people to participate within this trial again because of the stigma. I hope I've emphasised that you know there are adverse events and people really need to be know what they're doing when they're prescribing these drugs and we need a better pharmacological understanding of the ratios of thc and cbd and the dosing this definitely deserves ongoing research and i hope you, you'll see that from all the preclinical data that i presented we need to really pay attention to regulation and standardization. And as I say, the New Zealand Cannabis Agency is doing that. And in all of the recommendations, these drugs should only be used in conjunction with standard therapies. They are not standalone. There is no evidence for that. And that's the end of my talk. And I am very happy to take any questions. Oh, I've I obviously talked slowly because I've gone right through to one. Um, do you have time for? Um, we have six questions who are which are yeah, on yeah. our. I've my yeah. meetings at one fifteen. Okay, uh, so the first one is so just to clarify, individual patients cannot import their own medical cannabis. It must come from a pharmacy and a prescription from a doctor. Yes. You have to have a prescription from a doctor and people importing THC containing, they have to have a license. Cool. Uh, so it would be big wholesalers that would do that. But any pharmacy um, can get it from a wholesalers. Awesome. Our next question is, is it expected that patients will develop tolerance to CBD slash THC and need higher doses for future use? So everyone um, is concerned about that, but there is some evidence within the literature. It is actually quite a low uh, incidence of that, but you do have to get them up to the appropriate level that they require. So, you know, again, this should be addressed in the um, uh, some of these pain studies, because that's where I think, you know, you need more long term use. Whereas, you know, as an anti sickness agent, most people are going to be having it for six cycles or six months. So hopefully you wouldn't develop that tolerance. 
but yeah, more evidence needed. It is a possibility, but there's not that much evidence for it. All right. Our next question is, I hear from your talk that it is still a long way away before we know whether there are if there are good synergistic effects of chemo and CBD. As a patient willing to trial doing using CBD if and when I need more treatment, would there be any bad effects or contraindications? So um, it absolutely depends, you know, on your cancer, on what chemotherapy agents uh, you're being used. But generally, they um, CBD in particular combines very well with chemotherapy. Um, but you need to, you know, discuss that with your individual doctor, and it does depend on what what agents you're being prescribed. Awesome. Uh, next question is. Do you know if medical cannabis is being used overseas as anti-nausea drug in clinical practice? I know you mentioned phase three trial in Australia waiting for results, but other countries further along? Yep, so it's um, within the States it's used. There are three drugs that are FDA approved that are THC containing. Um, in Australia, it's used where a lot of this research that I've uh, presented and uh, in Canada as well. In Europe, they're a bit further behind. It's not as widely prescribed. But that's Satavix, that's actually produced in the UK. So um, that first pain study I presented was, you know, in the UK. So it sort of depends on the indication. But maybe we are a bit behind in New Zealand, I would say. Okay. Uh, next question is, why can CBD slash THC only be prescribed after other standard medication options have been used? I wonder if some patients would prefer using a CBD slash THC treatment, perceiving this to be more natural than standard medication. So none of the trials that have been um... Uh, produced have used it in that context. So that would be a complete evidence free zone. Um, and, you know, all those recommendations that I presented, you know, we should use standard um, drugs like metoclopramide on Danzatron. Um, you know, metoclopramide is very well tolerated. I know on Danzatron causes a lot of problems with constipation. So I do understand what that patient is saying, but it would be completely evidence free. Um, and this is our last question, and it's a little bit off topic, but how common is pain in blood cancer? Oh, again, very, so leukemia, I presume. Um, as a terminal event, luckily, it's quite rare. Um, you know, with acute myeloid leukemia, at the end, when the amount of leukemia in the bone marrow is expanding, you can get you know, bony pain, particularly in the back, but we're pretty good at, um, you know, treating that. So pain in acute leukemias or chronic leukemias generally isn't a feature. Um, sometimes in lymphomas, depending on where the lymphoma is, you know, and what organs are involved, there can be, uh, you know, higher pain levels. But in, in leukemias, generally, um, it's not a major issue but there are individual cases where you know just unpredictable pains that we sometimes struggle uh -huh. to understand why right. <clears throat> well um that's the end of our questions and uh, on behalf of leukemia and blood cancer new zealand as well as our patients uh, throughout new zealand we'd like to thank you claire uh, for right. this wonderful talk uh, very informative and insightful and I'm sure a lot of people will be looking forward to uh, reviewing this online on our YouTube channel. I learned a lot as well, Tim. Oh, great. Well, we wish you a Merry Christmas. And for those who are viewing uh, online today, wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, Merry Christmas. Hi, everyone.